Hello, it's Rob from Fountain Pen Journey. I'm going to talk to you today about using your pens, your fountain pens more, and um, more, more specifically, using your fountain pens at work in the office. It's a pretty obvious thing. If you want to use your fountain pens more, if you enjoy using them, things like, you know, the nice writing instruments. Where do we spend most of our working lives? Well, most of our lives, in fact. Often, for many of us, it's at work. And where do we write the most? Usually at work. Um, so fountain pens are an obvious uh, obvious thing to cover. Obvi really obvious subject for a fountain pen journey like this. Because when I first started uh, liking the idea of using fountain pens, pretty obvious that where I'm going to use them is going to be at work. So that was the route I took. Um, I'm going to say, first off, I work in an office pretty much all the time and using them outdoors doesn't work. They don't like the wet, they don't like dust. So if you work in an outdoor industry, fountain pens aren't the easiest thing to use. But if you happen to work indoors in a nice dry environment, um, then yeah, fountain pens are an obvious choice. Um, I'm going to start off with a bit like this. I mean. Formal attire. Uh, I have to wear office attire. It's got to be of a certain standard. We've all got our own individual styles, and our fountain pens often reflect that. So, whatever you do, if you're going to choose to use a fountain pen at work, then make sure that it's well. For, for, first of all, appropriate to your style. You know, some people like big pens, small pens, whatever it is. But make sure it's not going to attract unwanted attention. Now by that I actually mean, you know, derogatory comments. Nobody wants somebody to turn up to a meeting with some massive great pen that, like a quill or something, <laughs> completely outshine the box. Things like that. It's, it's not appropriate. Something that's too glitzy. If you, if you happen to like using, I don't know, bright pink glittery pens, they might not be the best thing for work. Tone it down a bit. You know, I don't like wearing this, but it's part of work. And, you know, because there is that level of formality, the pens that I happen to take to work and use at work reflect that type of, uh, of, um, of formality. So don't go overboard with anything. I'm not saying don't use your fancy pens, but just, you know, rein it in if you happen to just like bright yellows, greens and blues in your pen. Everyone's going to think, well, why has this guy turned up using that type of pen? So, first uh, thing to also mention is that if you use a fountain pen at work, and I've mentioned this in my introductory uh, video to my fountain pen journey, it will attract interest. Um, fountain pens are not very common in use, I would say, certainly in the UK. Um, I'm the only person I know who uses a fountain pen, and until I started using fountain pens in... July, June, July 2017, I don't think I'd actually seen a fountain pen or noticed a fountain pen anywhere um, since probably about 1990, which is when I was at school and I happened to use a fountain pen there. So that is not a very common thing. It's not a, um, it's not a widely accepted uh, writing instrument in the UK at the moment, which is making it all the more interesting for me and I guess viewers like yourselves because fountain pens are quite a niche thing at the moment they are in increasing in popularity I think the younger generation is starting to say we don't want digital everything we want to use something else and you know you pick up a pen and the next thing you know they discover a channel like mine and think oh yeah fountain pens they're quite interesting gives us a bit more option with pens, inks, different styles, things like that. So there is a lot to this hobby. And why not explore that at work? So just looking through things like this, for example, Jinhao 159. It's a big, heavy metal pen, the black version, very conservative. It's very good for the office environment. I've done a video review of this recently on this channel, so please do feel free to uh, have a look at that if you are interested in knowing more about this particular pen. Very cheap, 
couple of pounds or so on eBay, shipped to the UK from China. Nice medium nib, big, bold, heavy pen. Well, you could pass this off to the lay person in the office as a mob blanc, but you know, why would you? It's clearly not, but you know, this is you know, a name that people recognise. So when you draw this thing out of your breast pocket, you know, clips on there, and you go, oh, yes, and just sign this, take out your fountain pen, scribble away, and people are going to comment. So it will attract comments, even if it's something fairly boring looking like this one. You know, people will go, oh, I've not seen one of those for a while. So be prepared for that, because it's a really good part of the hobby. It attracts a lot of interest, and people, okay, some people, I mean, I had a colleague at work the other week said, Oh no, fountain pens. Last time I had to use those was at school. Thank God I never had to use them here. So, <laughs> you know, it's not to everyone's uh, taste, this hobby, but, you know, keep it, uh, keep it going for yourself and um, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of using your pens at work. Um, if you are going to use a fountain pen at work, there's a few considerations, not just the aesthetics, but also, I mean, I've got loads of pens now and there's some pens which are better suited to the work environment than others. This particular Jinhao 159, I have a read my, uh, watch my review by all means and see what I think of this pen. But one thing that doesn't work for me at all in using fountain pens at work is having to unscrew a cap. I find it cumbersome. It is a two-hand job. Yes, you can do it one-handed, but Really? I'm on the phone. I've got a mess of it. No. <laughs> it's not good. So a screw cap, for me, is a no-no. only takes... Let's count the turns. I believe it's one and a half, and it is, yeah, thereabouts, one and a half turns. Only one and a half turns, but that is not as convenient as, say, for example, this Jinhao. This is a Jinhao X450 pops off, clips on, pops off one-handed, put it down, you're ready to write. So for me, a push-on, pull-off cap is ideal. I'd also say try to look for a pen which doesn't have quite a clicky cap, because fountain pens, they're not like ballpoint pens, gel pens, or whatever you want, where if you leave the thing with the tip, the nib, the ballpoint exposed, it doesn't dry out. Fountain pens do. So you can't expect to go to a meeting, uncap your fountain pen at the start of the meeting, you've got your notes in front of you, sit there during the meeting, put the pen down, chat away for five minutes, pick the pen up and expect it to write, because fountain pens just don't. They dry out. It's an unfortunate part of what they are, but... I'll use this in here as an example because it's got quite a large silver coloured nib. Let's get this in shot. There we go. Right. Down the centre of that nib, running down the middle, is a channel. And if you don't know how fountain pens work, there is an ink reservoir in the pen and it goes into a feed in this part of the pen and the black plastic bit under there is a good example of that. Um, let's just make sure I've got this in shot, excuse me. There we go. So the black plastic bit is the feed which supplies ink to the metal nib on top. Um, this channel down the middle in between what is effectively two parallel tines, there is a tiny, tiny gap in between the two. Not a big gap, it's only, only small. And that draws ink down to the tip of the nib, which, through capillary action, basically because it's an aqueous liquid, or, well, an aqueous, <laughs> it's a water-based aqueous liquid, uh, ink, funnels its way down there, you put the nib on the paper and it draws it down and it writes that way. If you happen to have that nib hang on, where's my, where's my camera? There we go. That nib 
exposed in the work environment for more than a couple of minutes in some cases, what you'll find is that little channel between the two tines where the ink is dries up. So that is going to be a bit of an issue because what will happen, it will hard start and basically the pen won't write. It will take a little bit of um, sort of downward jabbing motions or something to try to get it to write properly again. So that is something to consider because if you have to screw on or, uh, or cap your pen every couple of minutes to stop it from drying out then quite honestly you're in a meeting doing this, taking notes, there's another sentence it's going to get annoying for everybody <laughs> um, so a slip on cap which pushes on quietly is always going to be a lot more um, appropriate for meetings so there's your choice of caps um, I'm also going to say a little bit about weight I mean the Jinhao 159 quite a heavy pen it's also quite thick it's got quite a thick diameter to the barrel of the pen and the section is quite bulky as well for me personally I find it a little bit too big not long just big it's too thick um, so it's not a comfortable pen for me to write with at work or anywhere. It's okay for the odd note, but certainly not extended writing periods. So choose a pen that's not too heavy, too light. Suits your own personal uh, preference as far as things like that go. Um, when I mentioned about nibs drying out between the times, um, there is another thing that you have to consider. I mean, modern offices quite often are air-conditioned. Air conditioning, summer or winter, is terrible for fountain pens because the air is so dry. And it will dry out that channel sometimes in a matter of seconds. I mean, I, I happen to have a desk in one of my offices which sits directly underneath the air conditioning unit. And in the middle of winter or summer, I've got a downdraft of dry air. And if I uncap one of my pens and sit there thinking about something for a little bit too long, talking a few less, less than a minute and happen to write that airflow has already dried out the channel between the tines and the nib will stop writing so it's very annoying one possible way around that if that is an issue for you is to use a fountain pen with a hooded nib and this is where the section which is the bit that you hold on the fountain pen so I'm talking about this part here bit that you hold, where the nib is below, extends over part or most of the nib and that effectively provides a um, protective cover for the, uh, for the tines so that that drying out issue is lessened and that is actually quite a useful tip for anyone who happens to find that their nibs dry out so quickly in the office it's impractical. If you want to go down the hooded nib route, what you'll find is the pens don't have the same amount of flex, or no flex at all, so you might lose a little bit of writing character, but you know it's going to prevent that drying out issue. So you can still use a nice looking fountain pen, but with a hooded nib. Choices are a little bit more limited, but have a look around and see what takes you fancy. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, we've talked about the cap. Now, the next thing is the um, use of your fountain pen. It's not always easy using a fountain pen at work for a simple reason. A lot of the fountain pen videos that you see um, use things like Rhodia paper, Tomo River paper. These are all papers in notepads and booklets, um, you know, which are almost specifically made for use with fountain pens. Main reason for that being is that they tend to be not very absorbent papers, so they don't draw in the ink, they don't bleed through, things like that. And they also allow the ink to dry slowly, which allows for sheening. If you've got a sheening ink, you might also get a little bit more um, shading, where you get uh, sort of variations in the colour of your lines on the paper, so things like that. I mean, that's what they're there for. And you'll see 
countless videos out there on YouTube where people are using things like rhodia pads because it's an accepted standard in the fountain pen industry and there's nothing wrong with that. But you found a workplace where you can actually use a rhodia notepad. You need to go to the stationery cupboard and it's the cheapest possible notepad ever. Businesses these days don't like spending money on anything for obvious reasons. They're all trying to save as much money as possible so they can make more. Uh, and unfortunately, that also means that if you're in an office where they're using any type of paper, it's almost certainly going to be the cheapest, if not the cheaper, end of the paper market. So, I mean, things like this notepad, really, really cheap, thin paper. So, how does that work with fountain pens? Well, the first thing you've got to consider is how your fountain pen ink, and, and, no, sorry, how your ink, is going to behave with that paper and what you'll find is that the really really cheap papers have bleed through so this is where you've got one side of the paper that you write on and the ink bleeds through to the other side it's a bit like using a <laughs> remember felt tip pen coloring the coloring in box nothing worse than turning the paper over and finding that the pattern on the next page has been obliterated or damaged by all the ink that's gone through to the other side of the paper that's bleed through that is an issue with certain inks quite a lot of inks to be honest on cheap paper but you may find that the correct, the correct nib size ha does help with that sort of situation so if you happen to use a ink which is fairly well behaved um, and for my own personal preferences I'm talking Waterman ink, Diamine both of those seem to be pretty well behaved ink manufacturers, their inks are pretty good. Uh, don't do too many weird things on paper or in pens. And those inks, if you use a fine or an extra fine nib on your fountain pen, tend not to bleed through because the nib lays down a finer, finer line. You've got less ink flow and it goes through onto the paper which absorbs it has the opportunity to absorb less ink. If you take a broad nib, um, possibly a medium, but mainly if you're going into the broad nib territory, double broad, all those sort of nibs, they lay down a great big thick line and lots and lots of ink. And if you write on cheap paper with those, it's just going to get sucked in. It's going to go straight through to the other side. And you may also get things like feathering, which is where you line those little sort of feathers effectively off either side where the ink is going into the fibres of the paper and moving out. It's finding another route in to saturate the paper another way. So if you use things like fine nibs, extra fine nibs, you're pretty much beginning to almost eliminate those problems. So cheap paper, extra fine or a fine nib. I found not too many issues with the paper that I use at work with a medium nib and partly because I'm a fairly fast writer so there's less opportunity for the ink to be sort of sitting there being drawn into the paper from the nib you know I'm scribbling away I'm, I'm not laying down gallons of ink just by sort of going slowly writing like this so that is one other thing um, medium nibs one thing that is quite useful to note about paper is that the cheap papers often have quite a rough finish. Your Tomo River, Rhodia papers, they have quite a, if you're not, uh, like a satin finish. Not glossy necessarily, uh, but satin finish. Very smooth, so you can write with an extra, extra fine nib and it, it, it's lovely to write with. An extra fine nib on cheap paper or some cheap papers can be really quite scratchy because what's happening is that nib is sort of finding all the little pits and bumps and uh, loose fibres and things like that on the paper and it's catching slightly on those. Even though the nib's tipped, you know, it's got two little balls on the end of those tines flowing across the paper with the ink, but it's not really, it's not, it's not moving freely because it is quite a fine point that you have applied to the paper. So a medium nib, in those circumstances, can actually help because the nib, for a start, the tip is a little bit bigger. Um, it's also laying down more ink, which is acting as a lubricant between the tip and the paper, so it's beginning to sort of keep the thing 
lubricate it as it writes across the page. So cheap papers, nib choices, all things to consider. The other thing that you also need to consider is what you're writing on. And if, like me, you tend to write on cheap copier paper, a lot of my writing is done on forms. So I'll go to the printer, print out, I don't know, 25 copies of, of a form, and then spend the rest of the, the day filling those forms in. And people don't always design forms very well. They make the boxes too small. And one thing, as a fountain pen user, you've got as an advantage over the ballpoint pen users is that you actually have the ability to write with very little pressure. You can still lay down quite a thick line of ink if you go slower. And you can write really quite smallly. With a smaller, smallly, it's not even a word. So you can write a lot smaller with a fountain pen than you possibly can do with any of the ballpoint pens. You've got more chance of writing you know, in boxes, on forms, in small boxes with a fountain pen than you could do if you were using a ball, ballpoint. And one thing that I would like to uh, just show you here is this little example. Now, let's uncap this pen over to the camera. That's alright, this is a bit weird, it feels like it's uh, I'm now behind you. Right, so, you've got your, get the thing the right way up, right, so you've got your nib on your paper and you can write with a, this is a medium nib, so what I'm going to write here is the word medium. Okay, so, there you go, medium. But if those lines in your writing are still too bold, or you still need to cram something into a much, much smaller box, say, for example, this is a form, and there's your box. But say, for example, the box was only this big, and you've got to cram it in. Yes, you can try and write smaller. This is a bit difficult in uh, holding it up behind the camera. But instead of doing that, what you can do... Is flip the nib over like that. So it's effectively upside down. Some people call this upside down writing. When I first got into fountain pens and I heard the term, I was confused as hell because I didn't know what they meant. I mean, did they mean sort of writing with the nib this way, that way? No idea. But if you have a medium nib like this, turn it so it is completely upside down so that the nib, the flat metal nib bit, is facing downwards, and then write with it. This is called reverse writing. So what you will find is that your line becomes much, much narrower. It becomes a nib size smaller or more. So we're talking going from a medium to a finer and extra fine, just just, excuse me, just by rotating the nib round and, the, and using it like that. What you will find is sometimes if you do that, nibs aren't really meant to be written with upside down. The tips, the tipping material is welded on there in an orientation so that you use the nib in the correct fashion. Not that you must use the nib in the correct fashion, but it's there to basically make the pen write how it was intended to write, or the nib write how it was in, intended to write. If you start writing upside down, reverse writing, what you can find is certainly if you're using a fine or an extra fine nib, it will be even more scratchy. So some nibs are better than others for reverse writing. Generally, most medium nibs I don't have an issue with a small amount of reverse writing, if you just need to put a few words in a very small box, it works perfectly. I wouldn't recommend it for trying to write copious amounts of notes. If you're writing page after page of A4 and you think, oh, I'm going to do reverse writing, well, the nib will dry out because it just doesn't work very well like that usually. So think about that. It's a good tip. It's something that you can use to, as a get out if uh, you really need to write in uh, small or fine writing, um, 
so it's worth considering. Um, another thing is carbon copy paper. Hardly ever seen these days, but some places still use it. There is a bit of a fallacy that you can't use fountain pens with it. Certainly, I would say if you've got a triplicate or more carbon copy um, booklet, you might have to press down a little bit harder than you should do with a fountain pen normally. I'm not saying completely muller the nib, bend it out of all shape, but just sort of, you know, you're going to have to press down a little bit harder to make that sort of um, carbon copy go through to the third sheet, say. Um, there are nibs uh, which were manufactured mainly in Germany. I believe that Pelican sold pens with the, um, I think it's called a DF nib, I believe. And that's a really, really stiff fountain pen nib. In fact, there is absolutely no flex. And the idea is that was used on carbon copies where you used to put the carbon paper behind and the cardboard and press down really hard to get the thing to transfer text from one form to another below. So anyway, just that is something, but you're never going to use one of those in, uh, as an everyday writer, I wouldn't have thought. Um, so your paper is important. Small writing we've covered, um, reverse writing, all of these little tips can be useful in the office and it's, you know, it's another excuse to actually use a fountain pen over a ballpoint pen, for example. Right, for the next bit I shall move on to inks. Inks are great. I never realised that I would actually really like inks. Uh, when I first got into fountain pens, I, I was really, really just about the design of the pen and the fact that it was something different. And then I discovered that you can get inks in all sorts of different shades and colours. Um, it's something for everybody. I mean, I've probably an infinite number of blues available, so if you happen to like writing with a blue ink, then there's a whole range of blues available. Um, you've got a wide, wide choice. Obviously, whatever you're going to choose, there is one issue with fountain pens, and that is that the inks are usually water-soluble. They're water-based, and the pigments and constituent components which make the ink coloured flow through the ink, you know, through the pen in the ink, because it's water-based. And because of that, fountain pen ink on the paper is not as water resistant as you will find from things like ballpoint pens. I can take a notepad outside full of writing and if it's a light bit of rain in the air on a normal British summer's day, I think you'll find if I've written with a ballpoint pen, it's still legible by the time I get from A to B or to the car, wherever I'm going. If I happen to have written this in a fountain pen ink, some of it will have run. It will, it will either run or fade or smear very easily. Very, very easy. So be aware of that. Um, what you can do to get around that is use something called a registrar's ink. So this is, a, if you like, a permanent or semi-permanent archive quality. So it's not going to deteriorate over time or it shouldn't do massively. Um, and those sort of inks tend to be waterproof. They're usually a bit of a pain to clean out and they stain nibs and if you've got a clear pen such as this demonstrator it's probably going to be an absolute nightmare to clean out from in here. It's, it's, it's going to stain the pen a little bit. So be aware of things like that. But if you really really must use a fountain pen at work and your employer states that the ink must be indelible your basic fountain pen inks, it doesn't matter who it is, chances are aren't going to be permanent enough for their liking. So just be aware of that. Um, bulletproof is another term for registrar's ink that seems to be interchangeable if you like. I may be wrong, but it seems to be a term that um, they use in the uh, USA quite a lot. Bulletproof ink is a waterproof ink. Um, registrar's ink in the UK, available in blue or black usually. <laughs> um, which brings me on to the next thing, choice of ink colour. Appropriate ink colours for work. I've worked in 
quite a few places where blue or black ink has been the only acceptable colour variations for ballpoint pens. In fact, I've even worked in some places where it has been black only. Um, reasons for this tend to be around things like um, quality control, quality assurance, where something's written and it's not changed, so you never write in pencil. The approved colour is black because it copies well on the old photocopiers, things like that. And it's the formal, sort of, formally accepted and written way of writing forms, things like that. So black ink or blue. Um, I tend to carry four pens at work uh, with me, well, at least four. I have one with black ink in it, one with blue ink in it, one with red ink in it, and one with green ink, just for a bit of a change. Excuse the continuity here because my memory card for some reason decided it only records about 30 minutes um, at a time, so apologise for that. Um, I'm going to just carry on with the ink discussion. Um, I was saying about the inks, the pens that I carry, four pens at work, different colours inks, three of which are conservative or accepted um, ink colours, and there's usually one which is outlandish. Fortunately, I mean, I, I am in a job where I um, have a lot of freedom and I'm free to take my own notes and use my own notes and only I need to see my notes so I can use whatever colour I like. Um, so I'm quite, I'm quite lucky from that point of view. Um, at the moment I'm using a purple ink, it's a very dark purple called Diamine Grape. And it's a lovely ink, it, it's blackish but it's got a slight hint of dark purple and I think it, it, it's even quite a conservative colour. I, I can certainly get away with using that on if you like, more formal um, documentation. So I enjoy being able to uh, at least use a few other inks at work rather than just blue or black. But even then, I mean, if you have to use a blue ink, why not use a fountain pen? And if you do have the op opportunity to uh, use a different type of uh, ink, different colour, then at least you can choose your blue colour of ink, um, which is nice. Um, let's see, inking up your pens. Ah oh dear, never going to be easy. Fountain pens, use ink. Yeah, obvious. They hold, liquid wise, volume wise, a lot more ink than a ballpoint pen would. And Unfortunately, they also get through that ink a lot quicker than you would do with a ballpoint pen. Um, there's two reasons for this. I mean, mainly they're using more ink. There's more ink being drawn through the nib onto the paper. The ink is um, a completely different formulation, really. And it's, yeah, because we like using these fountain pens, what happens is we use them more. So the, <laughs> we use even more ink. Um, I'd certainly say that if you need to ink up your pens, I've got a little routine, um, it's a bit of a ritual. In the evening, I'll go home from work, and if any of my pens are getting a bit low on ink, I'll refill them at home. I don't mind doing it, it's a nice little thing to do. Uh, if I want to clean the pen out and change over to a different ink, then I flush the pen and it takes me know, a few minutes. Um, I don't mind that part of my ritual with fountain pens. Um, people who don't like messing around and tinkering, you know, probably aren't going to be using fountain pens anyway. So my evening or Sunday evening ritual is swapping out my pens for different pens, refilling the inks, cleaning the pens, things like that. So I don't mind refilling at home and I've usually got enough pens with me at any one time for it not to be an issue. But I certainly do always carry sort of well, two, meet, uh, two pens to a meeting, just in case one ever does run out. Ink cartridges are another option. They're a mess-free way of using fountain pens. You've seen them all before. I mean, any pen which will take an ink cartridge, I mean, this particular Jinhao X450 just so happens to um, have a standard international cartridge converter in it and it will take standard international ink cartridges which is great because that means that you can carry a supply of ink cartridges around with you which don't leak, they don't burst, uh, they don't break 
and when one runs out you simply whip it out, pop a new one in, screw the pen back together and away you go, you're good to write. Um, personally I find ink cartridges not very easy to write with, I don't know, I just don't like them. Um, I would also say the ink choice, well the colour of ink choice, that your ink choices are restricted, you can't choose bottled inks in the same way, um, so you're already going down a bit of a sort of narrow path. Um, also you might have some manufacturers who insist on having a completely different ink cartridge, a proprietary ink cartridge, so you have to buy their ink cartridges or a cartridge converter if you want to use any type of bottled ink. Um, so those sort of things can be a bit of an issue if you happen to go down the cartridge route. Also, you're using a reusable fountain pen that should be good for many, many, many years. And I don't see any reason to use ink cartridges because you're just creating plastic waste that you might as well have just chosen a ballpoint pen because you're just going to be constantly throwing away bits of plastic as you use the ink cartridges. Uh, bottled inks. You could theoretically take a bottled ink to, uh, bottle of ink to work with you, leave it on your desk or in your desk drawer, things like that, and just refill up your pen at work. Easy to do. Easy to do. Um, but what I find is because I use so many different pens, so many different types of ink, this one I believe is, ref uh, is filled with, um, it is filled with Waterman Intense Black, but I have at least three or four black inks. And for the life of me, if I didn't know what was in this pen, I wouldn't have a clue what to refill it with. Because you don't want to refill and mix inks. Uh, you can end up with all sorts of clogging issues um, because different inks react differently, they've got different components, and they, they don't all play nicely when uh, when muddled together. So just be aware of that. But if, you, if you're limited to blue and black, you might as well take a bottle of blue ink and a bottle of black ink if that's what you're always going to use. So that's how I ink my, uh, my pens up. Right, so I'm going to go on to uh, the last part of this video, which is carrying and storing your fountain pens. If you happen to get into expensive fountain pens, by this I'm talking things which might, might cost over 150, 200 pounds. I mean, we're, we're looking at the, um, the price of, say, a mid-range to high-end smartphone. Would you leave it on the desk, unattended, and wander off at work or anywhere? Well, the chances are you probably wouldn't. So if you do carry an expensive pen, be aware. I mean, you probably already are, but don't be blasé about it, because it could well end up either stolen, because you know, workplaces don't always have the best people, or um, it could be even damaged. Um, accidental, you know, rolls off the desk. If you've got a nice writing desk at home for your very expensive pens, yeah, fine, you're going to take a little bit more care, but if somebody's talking to you and you happen to sort of knock the thing off the desk with a load of paperwork and you've just ruined a nice nib um, or a decent pen at least. So, yeah, consider that. It's always an option. Also consider things like accidental theft. Um, this is a Wing Song 63... Uh, no, the 3... D I do apologise. I'm going to... I've been using too many wing songs recently. This is a wing song 3008 piston fill fountain pen. And it's a clear demonstrator. Every part of the pen is clear, obviously apart from the metal portions and the uh, mechanism of the piston and the nib, but it's clear. Very popular, these demonstrator pens at the moment. People really do like them. I mean, they do look quite good. They perhaps look a little bit less old-fashioned and formal than these sort of pens um, but you know to the untrained eye this could look like any old plastic pen. Now I know these Wingsong 3008s are very cheap pens, they're only a couple of pounds on eBay um, but you can also get demonstrators, clear demonstrators, coloured transparent demonstrators that look very, very similar to this, to the layperson, 
who doesn't understand counting pens, and you could spend £200 on one of these pens. And Joe Bloggs comes along to your desk. Oh, Rob, Rob's not at his desk. I need a pen. Oh, someone, someone, uh, someone needs me to take a note from a phone call over there. Oh, this pen will do. And they just wander off with this pen. Gone. They're not going to think anything of it. Probably not until they uh, decide to uncap the uh, uncap the pen and go, oh, oh no, it's a fountain pen. They probably haven't a clue what sort of value that is, even if it's just a two pound pen that you really enjoy writing with. So, you know, they're probably going to forget where that pen came from and it's just going to get left on somebody's desk. So that pen has probably disappeared into the ether as far as you're concerned. So, you know, keep your pens with you or at least make sure that people are aware of um, the fact that, you know, you use fountain pens rather than wander off with your pen because they think it's just a ballpoint. Um, some people don't like using fountain pens at all. I mean, I've certainly come across people who go, well, don't mess with a man's fountain pen, you know, very personal, you know, don't write with another guy's fountain pen. <laughs> you know, some people don't do, don't, just don't do that. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about carrying and using your fountain pens. I mean, obviously, you've got your breast pocket, things like this, you just click the pen on, you might pop it on your trouser pocket, clip it in there. Be careful if you sit down, because, you know, not all pens are as robust as this all-metal gin how Demonstrator pen, I'm not saying it's easy to crack, but if you happen to be a bit on the heavy side, and sit down with it in your pocket, it may well crack and leave a really inky mess because it's uh, filled with ink. Um, if you happen to be that sort of way inclined, then you might consider using something like this, a pocket pen. Uh, this is the Delike Classic Alpha, uh, based on the, uh, if you like, much better and original uh, Quebeco All Sport um, fountain pen. Um, which is a metal pen. This is a tiny, tiny pen. Compare the two. Tiny, tiny little pen. This is all metal. It's got screw on cap. Unscrew that. Push to post, and you've got a, if you like, normal sized fountain pen. So it's very useful for little uh, bits of note taking. Very, very sturdy pen. Comes with or without a clip, as does the Caveco as an optional extra, um, which you can clip onto your pocket, but this thing is so robust, you can just stick it in your pocket with your keys if you're, so, if you're not bothered too much about scuffing it up a little bit. So pocket pens are a way forward for uh, ease of carrying. Um, there are videos out there about travelling with pens because if you've got an aeroplane and you've got a fountain pen because of the change in, change in cabin pressure during takeoff, landing, flights, all the rest of it, what will sometimes happen is the ink will start to make its way out of the pen. It'll be drawn out through negative pressure and it'll basically burp ink into the cap, which may or may not leak all over your suit or pocket. Um, I would certainly suggest, as a tip, general rule of thumb, either carry fountain pens on aircraft uh, completely full, fill it so there's no air gap, so the pressure can't affect it in the same way, or completely empty. Um, that will help immensely. Leaking pens aren't too much of a problem. I've had very few pens leak on me. You get the odd drop perhaps in the cap, but nothing significant. Um, and one thing that people do talk about is how do you carry your pens or store your pens more to the point. Nib up or nib down. That's through the cap. Nib up or nib down. Um, First off, if it's on the desk, it's horizontal. It doesn't make a scrap of difference. Some people don't think it makes any difference. Personally, I find if I store, store pens nib up like this, you can imagine the nib and the feed, any ink that happens to be in here, if, there's, if it's got, say, half a converter full or half a barrel full, that ink is going to sit there, the nib and feed is going to dry out. Um, the ink will also migrate downwards, the ink in the nib and feed will dry out. So I always store my pens nib down, and I find that works. I generally don't get any hard starts, so quite happy to 
recommend that as a way forward for anyone. Nib down, it suits me. Your, your choice may differ. Um, right, why are demonstrator pens uh, popular? Just while we're on, uh, on, the, on the subject of carrying and storing pens. I think possibly because you can see the ink level. That is a real bonus when you're at work. There is nothing worse than having a pen which is completely opaque and you've no idea what the ink level is. So you're going to your meeting, you're rushing around, you've got two minutes to go and grab all your notes and everything, and you pick up a pen, you have no idea what the ink level is. So that's why I carry two pens to every meeting. It's quite straightforward. I always know one of them at least has quite a lot of ink in. Um, I mean, yes, you can unscrew it, unscrew the barrel from the section, there's the converter, CD ink level, screw it back on, but it all takes time. Demonstrator pen, with a clear demonstrator, you've got the piston here, let's turn the filling knob, we've got the piston that goes up and down there, locks in place, this whole ink chamber here, you can see how much ink you've got in there at a glance. No need to worry. So that's why demonstrator pens are quite good for carrying at work. Um, I would also say, you know, whatever you do with fountain pens at work, enjoy using them. Use it as an opportunity to use your pens. If you're having a bad day in the office, you just think, oh, you know, I'm going to write something. You know, nobody's ever going to say, you know, stop working, don't write. You should be typing or something. Um, unless that really is your job. Uh, in which case, you know, you better go get on with some work. Um, enjoy fountain pens at work. It's an opportunity to use them. Um, it can make your make your working day a little bit more fun, more enjoyable. Play around with your inks. You know, take a black ink if you need it. But if you've got the opportunity to use an, I don't know, a nice burgundy ink or something, then by all means, you know. Swap it over, use a different coloured ink if you can. Enjoy it, it's a hobby. You might as well extend that hobby to work because it's still work, you're not losing out. Nobody's losing out. Um, like this channel, if you take your pens to work, it's going to encourage other people, hopefully, into uh, being interested in fountain pens and possibly even taking up the fountain pen hobby. Um, it's quite a diverse hobby, and if you've got different ink colours, different pens, different styles, different colours, all these things can actually sort of, you know, grab somebody's attention. I use this channel to promote fountain pen use, specifically in the UK, because I think it's really, really underrepresented. I think in America it's Fountain pen use is still quite a minority thing, but it's, it's, it's got a cult following. A following, sorry, I used the word cult. I didn't really mean the word cult. It is a cult, really. Don't tell anyone. Um, it has got a cult following. So, in the UK, that really doesn't exist. There certainly aren't loads of fountain pen shops. There's only a couple of fountain pen retailers that specifically deal with fountain pens or so. Um, it's, it's, it's not a massive part of uh, the British culture anymore, which is a bit of a shame. So I use this channel to try to promote fountain pens and encourage others to discover, like I do, the fountain pen hobby. I'm on a fountain pen journey, so you know I'm hoping you will be too. Um, if you take your pens to work, you have the opportunity to perhaps even encourage other people to use fountain pens. It will attract interest, it will attract comments, people will be like, oh, what's that? What are you using? Why is that ink that colour? You know, there's a whole range of reasons. And you could just be the next, uh, looking at the next convert. So use the opportunity to take your fountain pens to work as a way of recruiting more people into this hobby and promoting it getting more people involved, you make the community more successful, everyone enjoys the hobby a lot more, there's more uh, diversity, manufacturers have more of a reason to make more fountain pens, and um, it keeps the whole thing going. So get out there, take your pens with you, enjoy using them at work, enjoy getting other people involved. It's all there, you know, it's not an expensive hobby necessarily. 
you can, like I've said today, two pounds for those three pens, ten pounds for that pen. It doesn't cost the earth to get into this hobby. You can use any of these at work and not worry too much about any of them going missing or getting damaged. It's fun. You can do all these things. So get out there and enjoy the hobby. Take your pens to work. Enjoy using different inks at work. Do a bit of experimentation. If your pen happens to be sort of leaking, bleeding, I'm sorry, ink happens to be bleeding through, you know, try a different ink. Try a different nib size. You can use your pens at work. You might as well use the opportunity to make work a little bit more fun. So thank you very much for watching this video. Sorry it's been quite a long one. It's been longer than my usual videos. So if you are interested in following my own fountain pen journey, perhaps it's similar to yours, do feel free to click the subscribe button below because I talk about all sorts of things on occasions like this. But I also do lots of pen reviews. Um, there's more on the way as I discuss how I progress on my own fountain pen journey. I hope you found this video interesting. And um, then, until next time, I shall see you soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.